I hope you can all well hear us, um, that our microphones will work, also that everyone online will be able to hear us. Um, my name is Claire Alborn. I will be moderating this panel. I work for Rubico, um, where I engage our investment com our investee companies on exactly this topic of biodiversity. So today I will be switching the role and not ask companies to do better, but ask the panelists here today uh, what we also as investors and corporate investors can do. I think over the last years, the realization that biodiversity is so much at the core of climate change, accelerating it, but also being a solution to it is uh, to no one's surprise here and has taken up rapidly over the last years. So I won't go into that too much. Um, I think what is missing for many of us and what I've also heard from the panel before us is that we're often still missing these concrete steps. What can we do as investors, as companies? What is needed to actually get this financing flowing so that we can mm -hmm. use the existing market tools or develop new tools to fill the gaps? Um, so that is exactly what we'll be discussing today. I hope that you also all have questions uh, online that you can type them into the chat box and we'll hope to answer some of them. With that, I wanted to introduce my panel today, uh, which I'm very happy to host. Uh, perhaps I can start with Petri here to my left. Um, Petri is the founder of the Innovit Innovative <laughs> Impact, Innovation. In Innovative Impact Innovation Institute. <laughs> um, and has a very long experience in especially uh, pension fund and uh, sovereign wealth fund management. Uh, and will be taking a bit more an external view as an external advisor to uh, financial institutions and investors. Uh, after that, we have Marcel de Berg, who is um, a strategic connector and uh, the founder of the Green Water Cools Collaborative. So he will be really addressing some of the elephants in the room, or perhaps the one elephant in the room, as he's doing with his initiative, Arul. After that, we have Andrea Kalan, um, who is coming from the German Development Bank. Uh, and they're very much focusing on the nature-based solutions investments, as well as investments into forestry on the uh, private equity side. And I'll leave it to you afterwards to introduce it a bit better. Uh, and then last, we have Martin Berg uh, joining us from the UK today, um, who is uh, working as a chief investment officer at uh, Climate Asset Management, where he is leading the, the sorry, nature-based carbon strategies. Um, and so he'll be also talking a lot about how can we release more finance and how can we make it more accessible for mainstream institutional investors. So with no further ado, let's get into it. And I think I'll ask the, my first question to Petri. Um, so in the past, you have talked about a funny funding gap, um, really struggling to connect the demand and the supply side of finance, especially nature, positive finance. And I was hoping that you could explain a bit what you meant by it and what the issues behind this funding gap are. Yes, I think in, in, in short, if I uh, summarize, the, the issue is that um, which is the same within the blended finances that the people don't really know each other who are either project owners or then then the institutions we have a formation of of which is quite silo based at at the larger institutional investors so um we have dfis who tend to group with uh, between each other we have uh, uh, pension funds, insurance companies, they all tend to be uh, hovering around same same groups talking about that we need to mobilize uh, private finance and and quite often in these events the private finance people are not present which makes of course a little bit difficult things for things to happen and and then the project owners um, like like on the natural capital 
my background to forestry is that um, I was the first chairman for Finnish Tornator 20 years ago, 600,000 plus hectares of, of Finnish uh, forests. And then I was also the co-founder for Finnish uh, Dasos Capital, which is today a 1 billion uh, euro forestry fund. And, and, and it tends to be that when I today look at the things that why aren't we reaching more deals. So the institutional side is saying that, uh, oh, we don't have any deal flow. And, and the project owners are, are very desperate in, in, in their efforts and, and saying that, okay, there's no money available. And, and it's, it's then quite obvious that you have a gap, which looks quite funny. And, and, and obviously something needs to be done for this gap in order to, uh, for more uh, assets to uh, materialize. We can later talk more on what are the issues on the institutional side, uh, because the natural capital is very rarely an asset class within the institutions. But maybe I'll stop at this point here. Yeah. No, thank you very much. Perhaps just following on to that, Marcel, how do you see this, the current state of, let's call it nature positive finance or nature based solutions in finance? And what do you think is the elephant in the room on that front? Um, okay. Well, nature positive, um, look, before I address that, um, I think that's the, the emperor that's wearing no clothes at the moment. Um, and the elephant in the room for me is that um, it was addressed in the first panel by, uh, uh, about biodiversity. When you look at uh, the role of biodiversity, uh, people are jumping to conclusions. Uh, it's about carbon or it's about uh, animals or whatever. Uh, but biodiversity is much more than that. It's, and it's much more than only preventing droughts. It's only much more than producing food. It's much more than producing biomass. It's much more restoring a water table. The elephant in the room is that we are living on a water planet. And uh, nature uh, controls through the green water cycle uh, the cooling capacity of Earth. And biodiversity, from a functional point of view, from the cooling perspective, has two elements in it. And the right biodiversity produces organic aerosols. And therefore, you need to have a healthy soil and plants and trees on top of it. You need a high biodiverse landscape. Together, you need to have water. So those plants and trees need to have enough water to evapotranspire. And when you have water vapor in the air, and you've got the organic aerosols, they connect to each other, they form clouds. And those clouds really cool our planet because they increase the albedo effect of Earth. So, since 1880, we not only increased the amount of carbon in the air and it puts on a warmer blanket of Earth, but at the same time, you have to uh, notice that the energy balance of Earth is the warming elements minus the cooling. So a blanket is more warming, but if you reduce the cooling capacity of the air conditioning of Earth, the active air conditioning, you get the balance is one minus one, and uh, one minus one is zero, yeah, but if you put more warming in, it's 2 minus 1, it's plus 1. They can also arrive at plus 1, 1 minus 0. So when you destroy biodiversity, you destroy the green water cycle. When you destroy the green water cycle, you dis destroy the producing of clouds, then you reduce the cooling capacity, and that warms up the planet. So it's, we have done two things. Since 1818, we destroyed 13 times the size of France of high biodiverse uh, landscapes. And that also warms up the planet. So if you start up saying carbon, it warms up the planet and destroys biodiversity, now wait a minute, there's also one other thing around. We destroyed biodiversity, that warms up the planet, and that further destroys biodiversity. So if you want to address this topic right for yourself, your children, your family, your company, and future generations, start thinking in green water. And when you go back to financing nature positive, I'm just counting almost 30 years in responsible investing. And I can say from experience that the task that is ahead of us is so big that the things that we are doing now is just a drop in the ocean. And why is it a drop in the ocean? Because we're playing with the, the wrong rules of the game. As long as we play with the wrong rules of the game, 
investors will not optimize the risk return profile for the, for the participants, companies will not optimize the profits, we need to change the rules of the game and very quickly. So that's why I'm saying the emperor has no clothes on, because we're playing in this room, in society, with the wrong rules of the game. As long as you don't recognize that, you can go on, but that's just a drop in the ocean. Yeah. Okay, so basically we are missing a huge part of biodiversity and what is causing and also helping to solve climate change. But also you, see, you don't see the solution because if you, yeah. if you restore nature, you will stabilize climate, lower temperatures, and you will achieve power scores much cheaper and faster. So it's not only <laughs> the elephant in the room will help us, we only have to see the elephant in the room. Yeah. Okay, well, perhaps, Martin, to you, um, you're working a lot on this and working a lot on also making these <laughs> tools and financial tools more accessible for all kind of investors. Uh, what's your view on this and, and what do you think are the key challenges? Do you think this is reflected currently? Yeah, no, no, thank you very much and, and hello everybody and uh, thanks for inviting me and maybe just as a big as a background, climate asset management is an asset management firm entirely focused on products around nature. So we really try to bring this to the mainstream, both for institutional investors through the investment lens, but also we're working with a lot of corporates on net zero targets and that have slightly different needs. Um, yeah, and, and so we're having discussions a lot, right, on, on, on what can more mainstream um, institutions and investors do. And, and I, I, I do think myself, they, they do see that problem. I don't think that they're oblivious to it, but I think they, I think the biggest problem or the biggest issue for them is, and, and, and Petra, you mentioned it, is, is like for them, it's like, okay, but how do I actually do that? What is that actually? Nature is not, what is nature? Nature is not an asset class. Um, and, and I always, um, and, and they really struggle. I mean, we have some jurisdictions where already biodiversity is something that, at least from a disclosure perspective, companies have to look at. If you look at France with their Article 29, we went and saw a CIO of a big insurance company, and, and he said, I hope you're finally the person that explains to me how to invest in biodiversity. So I think it's not seen that, that this is an issue they should deal with, but it's like, okay, how do you do that? And I think that the trouble is that when, 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 when you look at nature, then you have to kind of break it down. What is it? Is it an asset class? Is it something that is integrated in asset class? Does it already exist? So we have some investors that, of course, are already very experienced in investing in forestry and in agriculture. Then lots of investors are investing into, into smaller impact funds. And then, then others are, are, are focused on environmental products. And I think the real trouble at the moment is how do we bring this together, but also how do we bring this together and, 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 and show that this is not only, let's say, in a philanthropic exercise in order to achieve impact, but also to, to, to achieve the necessary returns which a mainstream investor has to do and I think that's that's the challenge and I think uh, the, the the crooks will be to build products that can achieve the, the uh, both of them and I'm sure we get a little bit later on how we how we can do that yeah thank you and then lastly to you Andrea and perhaps linking back a bit more to this funny funding gap and then we'll get back to all of this again again and again um, I think deck and your your work is a lot on creating a bridge between exactly the people on the ground, seeking investments, especially those that do still have quite a high risk profile, um, and mainstream investors, um, or perhaps not. I, so I think I'll just hand it to you and explain a bit your role in this um, and your thoughts on perhaps also both sides, the key struggles there. Yes, um, great, thank you. So uh, DEG is a development finance institution um, which promotes private sector development in emerging markets. And as such, we um, operate at the interface between the private sector and national but also international development policy objectives. And this really puts us in a position where we um, um, yeah, where, where we can mobilize more corporate finance for uh, climate change mitigation or biodiversity conservation goals. But in practice, it's not without difficulties. So in the past, um, DG um, focused a lot on job creation in a variety of sectors, but less so in forestry. Also because it's a quite difficult asset class, there are very high risks, but uh, uh, returns do not necessarily compensate for these risks. Um, now uh, the situation has changed because we have given ourselves an impact and climate strategy and thus can look at those investments not only from a development uh, perspective but also from a climate change angle. And um, 
this means in practice that uh, we are operating uh, currently under a special DEG initiative, uh, the Carbon Sinks Initiative, where we have earmarked uh, for ourselves a certain investment amount, uh, which is dedicated to forestry and nature-based solutions, and where we can accept lower rates of returns and also much longer uh, tenors um, of over 20 years in some cases. Uh, which gives us a lot more, more liberty. Um, but as you can imagine, this is also quite costly for DG because um, as opposed to some other DFIs, we um, invest mostly from our own balance sheet, so we do not have uh, any government funding. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that, that means for us that at the moment we, we look mostly at uh, commercial timber plantations and um, the timber processing industry and um, the other more exotic types of natural climate solutions we do as indirect investments, so basically through fund structures. But as part of our strategy, we are also applying for uh, blended finance now and hope to be able then to do more in the future, also in terms of larger tickets, even riskier projects, and also hope to mobilize then, um, also be, be able to de-risk investments in order to mobilize more corporate finance. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, yeah, so there's so many things on the table already now. Um, and we'll get back to some of them. But one thing I had, and especially that came out in the beginning, um, and I think that is core to address uh, throughout the whole debate, is to what extent, as Marcel mentioned, we have to change the rules of the game, and to what extent the, our system and our financial value system that we operate in right now uh, is fit for that and what would have to change. Um, so that's a very broad question. I'll just ask it to all of you. So whoever wants to pick it up, feel free to. Let me start as a, as a Dutch person. <coughs> because I've got, as a Dutch person, I've got a slight advantage. Uh, and the advantage is that we live on the sea level. Mm -hmm. And we already live on the sea level for more than 750 years. So if we wouldn't have dikes and water infrastructure, we would not be here at this moment. So what we have done, we have institutionalized our commons. And biodiversity and the cooling capacity of nature is a common, it's not only a local common, it's a global common. If you want to maintain a common, you can do from an economic perspective several things. Like we do in the Netherlands, for maintaining our water infrastructure, we pay a separate water tax. We not only pay a separate water tax, but every four years we vote for the people sitting on the water board for managing their water infrastructure. So we have a tax in place and we have a governance structure in place. The other thing you can do is price in the positive and negative side effects. So when you're talking about the rules of the game, it should be, we shouldn't be here in five years' time. In five years' time, Heineken would serve real cool beer, Unilever would serve real cool ice cream, the ones that are building the houses will make a real cool house, because everything will be connected how the value chains are integrating biodiversity within the value chain. And then you, sh you should not ask an investor to make a separate asset class of it, no. An investor should only focus on the risk-return profile for the participants on the long run. If those risk-return profiles for investing in nature are not solid enough, then there is something wrong with the rules of the game. We are not pricing in, or we don't do something wrong fiscality, legal, spatial, or we have the, the wrong trade agreements. And at this moment, the task ahead of us is restoring 13 times the size of France for biodiversity, and we're now talking about well, perhaps the province of Utrecht, and there's a small province in, in, in the Netherlands on, on the scale that we are, are re restoring. That's about the rules of the game. And then the rules of the game is how you protect and maintain your commons. So as long as we have to sit here, and talk about and convince institutional investors, it's a separate asset class and you have to take the risk, no way. It should be a no-brainer. As long as it's not a no-brainer, then we're doing something wrong in the Netherlands, in Europe, in the entire world. Yeah? So that's, 
the emperor has no clothes on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sorry to say, but... Uh, I like to use a little bit other other type of words, uh, and and I'm usually talking about intentionality, the change of mindset with, within the uh, investors, and and basically every investor should ask themselves a question: Is there something you care about on top of your financial returns? And and this is obviously now at the core of the impact investing. That that uh, what should you uh, care about on top of your final financial returns and and uh, you don't see many um, investors who have been able to define this intentionality and and if you care about nature as as Marcel was pointing out nature is uh, deriving roughly half of the world's GDP maybe it it has an, an effect or it, it should have an effect on, on how you allocate your assets. I'm sorry, I fully disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Why I do I fully disagree? If investors should have the intention to do good, then there's something wrong in the system. It should be implicit that the investors take into account every aspect of their investment and they're doing, by definition, a good element. As long as 99.9% .9 of, the, of the money is not implicitly invested correctly, then we are having a big problem because then we are playing the wrong rules of the game. So as long as it's about intentionality, we are going the wrong direction. I mean, just to build the bridge between the two of them, because I think, I think, I think you're right, Marcel, that we need... Um, this needs to be factored in and should be factored in. And, and, uh, and I think the problem for many investors at the moment is in, in the Netherlands, it's a pretty clear-cut case, right? You, you have a hundreds of years of experience and, and you went through a couple of disasters and the governance process that you have in place now, they weren't just invented overnight because somebody had a brilliant idea. There was a very long, painful process by learning and doing and seeing what consequences. It, it actually, or what it means to, to live below the, 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 uh, the, the sea level. And I think the problem at the moment that we're facing globally is that um, even those countries where they're starting to mandatory to, to, to kind of factor in the risk, or at least to disclose the risk, is really challenging. So the information is not there. So I think we are facing this information gap. And I think I would argue um, the, the best way to convince the, the finance sector, um, and we've seen this on climate, um, how, how change actually the, the, the whole approach to, to climate is, is is to really understand the risks that are re that are relating to to nature and that that changes and, and, and moves people and and when we when I look I always had the same experience when um, in my in my, my, my previous experience is the moment the risk um, in the moment it becomes clear this is a material risk to doing business, then that is the moment when investors are looking at it and trying to factor it in. And that's what we're seeing now at the moment around the world with climate. And I'm convinced that, that, that this or a similar process will be started on nature. It's a little bit more difficult to do that because we have the, the, the data is so much more complex. It's such a local problem. We don't have one metric like in, in, in climate, and we can discuss that. But I think, I think that's the that's way if you're thinking how, how can you actually change the system, I think that's, that's how it can be changed because we can't just change now from top down having some regulation without actually knowing what, what the risks are. So it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a, of a of kind of a, a learning by doing. And, and I think that process has been started. That's, that's the positive news here. And I have some good news for you because with the Green World Cools Collective, we have collected the information about the cooling role of nature. So you can calculate a free risk insurance uh, uh, <coughs> policy mm -hmm. because we know what the assets are at risk with certain temperature uh, rises, but we know it's exactly how much nature cools. So when you have those probability distributions and you calculate them, then you have the real value of nature. But the problem is we don't see the real value of nature. We only look at the carbon side, the, the animals, uh, the droughts, food, etc. But when you see the cooling capacity, then you see how you can reduce the asset at risk enormously and that's what you first have to see. That's the elephant in the room. If you don't see it, you will not act on it. When you see it, and that's why we try to have uh, companies like Munich Re, Swiss Re, etc., helping us to calculate the risk premium of the, the cooling capacity of nature. And when that's it, you can s lower the assets at risk in your portfolio. Because then you look at Heineken in a very different way. Yeah? 
and, you, and then you do the engagement with Heineken. And you say, okay, please increase the cooling capacity of your of your value chain. Then we're going to invest in it as as, as a pension fund, or in, in, or we set up funds for it. Yeah, and then things start rolling. But you only have to see it because it, it, as long as you don't see the real value of nature, and it's not seen by Franz Timmerman who's uh, heading the, the, the EU on, the, on this topic, then you have a real problem. He's thinking in, 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 in energy plants with, with, with biomass in it. Yeah, how silly you can be. Yeah, so first you have to see the real value of nature. And from a value at risk point of view, everybody in this room should say, wait a minute, you can reduce our value at risk so much? And then comes a no-brainer. And then you knock on the doors of governments and you want to change the rules of the game. And then you stand next to Unilever, Heineken. We want new rules of the game from this on, this moment on. Yeah, and not not wait for it. You have to be proactive. Yeah. I think the message is uh, yeah reaching the audience. I also see some questions coming in, and it actually fits really well with also my kind of how I was hoping that we could go forward. Because I was wondering, how can we make this more concrete also for the audience here today? And how can we really le leave everyone afterwards with some concrete steps and concrete mm. things that they, um, that they can now take away from that? Uh, I see some questions coming in already, so perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll take... Perhaps there's one online and then I'll switch to one in the audience and then we continue on some of the other questions. Um, so... A question from online is, is the voluntary market considered by corporates for reaching their net zero? And if yes, what is the proportion of investments in the voluntary market versus, versus the regulatory compliance? And if not, what is the obstacle? Does anyone want to take this? We assume this is a voluntary carbon market? Or? Mm -hmm. So it's assuming this is a voluntary carbon market, then I think the answer is yes, it, it is being used, but um, obviously most companies are advised to do the internal action first and really using it for a very small percentage, um, you know, the SBTI, the science-based targets initiative said just 10% um, of, of the overall kind of um, net zero target that they set themselves. Um, and I think if you look at the values um, of this, obviously this is still a very small and nascent market, but it's growing if you compare it to compliance markets, which are not really investment in, in credits, but they are allowance-based and those allowance prices are just traded higher, so I think you're comparing apples and oranges, but the, the values of compliance markets at the moment still higher, which is, in my mind, would suggest that um, if, you, if, you, if you really want to move the, uh, the needle, then governments have another chance here to also allow some, some of these voluntary market credits to use for some compliance obligations. Yeah. Um, do you still, yeah, I see one hand here, and then, ah, oh, so many already. <laughs> Perhaps let's take one and then uh, we'll go. I also still have one question, and then we'll, we'll jump back and forth. I hope this is working. Um, hi, I'm, my name is Lucky. I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm also a developer from the Global South. So how I think something concrete can happen here is to support uh, entrepreneurs and developers you know, with early stage financing. So I'm very happy to say that I have a fellow partner here in the form of SK Forest, who actually supported us. And the reality is that, you know, DEG, KW, all of the blended finance, DFIs, you want a project when it's ready to go, but somebody has to actually develop it to get to, to, to that stage. And that's where I think all corporations can move because you don't have to wait forever for people to do due diligence, etc. So what I really like to understand from you all here is to, what do you think concrete steps can be done by the companies that are here today to actually move the needle so that we can move, you know, within a time frame that makes some sense? That's my question. Very good one. <coughs> Any voluntary uptake? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm happy to take that. I mean, you're, you're identifying, like you're identifying a, a huge problem, and I think um, that is, I mean, but it's not a problem to nature. I've been working in, in public kind of um, impact related finance you can take any market where this, this is a problem right that uh, the i mean this 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 funny kind of situation that you decide like that there on the one hand side is is funding available on the other side 
um, uh, they say, but there's no projects. On the other side, there are project developers and saying there's no funding that exists in any market. And it doesn't, you don't have to go to the global south, you just have to go to Europe. I mean, the, the complaint is, is, is always the same, right? So how do you do this mismatch? But you're right that there's a, there's a lack of risk capital to develop projects. Um, I do think that some corporates are moving now in that direction to identifying that. So they're, they're actually having a bit more risk appetite. And what we noticed is working both with institutional investors and with corporates is that actually the corporates at the moment are much more willing as part of net zero targets to take some of those risks. And we, we see that as very positive. But, but nevertheless, there, there are gaps. And I think there are a lot of ideas, initiatives, both on the private sector. There are some, this morning I spoke to an innovative idea how you can actually use this completely through more the, the private side. But there, I've, I'm also saying we have never seen so many interest from all sorts of organizations and can sometimes they're, they're financed by corporates, sometimes they're financed by NGOs, sometimes they're financed by government on programs, how we can actually fill this gap and how, how this finance can be made available. So I think it's, it's, it, it is a challenging project because this is the highest risk of, of any project before you actually have a what in, I used to work for the European Investment Bank, what we call the bankable project, which we, and we prefer to only focus on bankable projects. So I think that this is the higher risk of the project. So that's, that is, that is that's the challenge there. But I do think that um, uh, more and more corporates in particular understanding that, that if they want to have good projects, they also have to engage that early on. Perhaps Andrea, do you, or, and then Marcel also wanted to add anything. Do you have anything you wanted to add or kind of how you approach these projects? Yes, I just wanted to make a remark on also the things we touched upon earlier about regulation, etc. So I think um, I think that's um, it's still necessary to have this, these regulations, of course, and um, uh, because we are dealing here with a global e negative externality, basically, both for climate change and for biodiversity, etc. And it also hinders us really as institutions to do more in some cases to, don't, to do not have the right regulation in place. Um, but for us with NDEG, what has really been a game changer is the voluntary carbon market uh, because that gives us the opportunity to um, yeah, put this monetary value on, uh, on, 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 well, on climate change mitigation and uh, approach those projects from an investment perspective and not merely as an expense. And I mean, we are of course very aware of all the um, issues still out there within the voluntary carbon market, trans the transparency, integrity, etc. issues. But still, I think it's one of the most realistic approaches available at the moment. And it has been quite helpful. So. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's the way we can approach this at the moment. Of course, I mean, if everything was already priced in, that would be great, but it will probably take some time. So, yeah. Yeah. I, we're, we're getting to the end of our session, so I would ask one question, and then Marcel, I think then you can also bring in your last points you wanted to mention um, in that. Is what we're doing right now enough, and what can be our call for action to accelerate the financing uh, of nature-positive investments. I think I'll start with you. And just, yeah, we don't have too much time, so. Um, in the Netherlands, we had uh, a great philosopher uh, in the last uh, 75 years, and he said, you only, uh, you only see it when you understand it. And he played also a little bit of football. It was Johan Cruyff. And you really have to see what's going on. If you don't see the cooling role of nature, then you have a real serious problem. We tried to convince, uh, we gave some advice to the voluntary carbon market in saying that not every carbon is equal. Because the green water carbon, green water carbon has much more value than a grey carbon credit that is harvesting by technology. So if you go back to the previous question, if a company is not part of a value case, so first you've got a business case, but you have a higher order value case. If they don't see the value case where they're operating in, they don't see the smallholder farmers, then you also will not see the solution how to get those incentives to the smallholder farmers. So we have been discussing, perhaps you should give a discount on the green water carbon credit. So if a company offsets 
uh, the carbon, they get a discount on the clean water carbon. <laughs> and that will be surplus by government money so that it has enough incentive for the smallholder farmers to make their business case uh, w working. And when you look at Africa or whatever, you can make a value case out of it that development money of the G20 will secure, restore uh, the, the, the biotic pump in Africa from the west coast to the east coast, increase the water table, yeah? then you will increase the livelihood of people over there, yeah? and you will solve a lot of problems between Egypt and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, Ethiopia about now. You get less climate migration to Europe, you stabilize discussions in Sweden and in the Netherlands about right-wing people that don't like foreigners. Yeah? So you get triple value of your money and also increase the return. But you have to start with the value case. You need to look at the, the elements in the, in, in, in the system. Yeah? And in the end, it's a social problem. Who is going to pay the bill? And if you don't address that, forget it. Tell your children that we did our best. So. We're at the end, but perhaps just in 30 seconds, also the last word to Petri, Andrea, and Martin. Um. Yeah, I, I think collaboration is, is something what is needed. Money doesn't come from the sky. You need some other actions also on top of, on top of the money, and, and people need to get, get, get together. There are a lot of corporations. We know the large, some, some of the large companies which have already engaged and committed capital and actions and and how that can be taken taken in in the broader level that that's only that needs a lot of work and and i think that's my answer to to lucky on the on the on the problem there is money and 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 there are good projects but we need to get them together yeah take that step andrea yeah, I actually agree with Petri on the collaborations. I think partnerships are incredibly important and also more unusual <laughs> partnerships are e examples out there, for example, of fund managers now entering into collaboration with NGOs or with scientific institutions and coming up with new concepts and ideas. Um, and in that context, I also wanted to um, uh, to note that uh, we as DG are also looking to expand our network and are actively looking for co-investors. So, um, well, any corporate sharing our values and vision is very in much invited to talk to us. That sounds like a, a good invitation. And then the last word to you, Martin. Yeah, I, I, I think we need to continue talking about nature is the next subject for the finance sector and they have to tackle it. I mean, we see it here on the conference. It used to be corporate investment into forestry summit. Now it's forestry biodiversity. I'm sure at some point Aaron will rename this a corporate investment into, in, into nature summit. And I think once we're there and once it's really clear to all the investors what that means, what the risks are, what the opportunities are, then you actually have to also something, then, 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 it's, then something can move. Yeah. One final thing. It, it, under, my, under my picture was our green spine, but um, we are part now of the Green Water Cools Collective. So if you want to join, then please let me know and I'm happy to uh, get you on board. So. Great. Thank you very much. I think a big invitation for everyone to still ask all your questions afterwards, all the questions that haven't been answered, um, and pick up the discussion with the panelists today and among yourselves to seek for these collaborations. And with that, a very big thank you to all of you and to the audience for listening in. <laughs>